بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا وإمامنا وحبيبنا أبي القاسم محمد بن عبد الله وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي I praise Allah Almighty and I send prayers and blessings upon Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam his noble family, righteous companions, and all those that follow them with the right guidance until the day of judgment. Ameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dear brothers and sisters, welcome to part two of uh, this series about faith without manners and manners without faith. In the first part, just to uh, refresh your memory, we dealt with the first phenomenon, which is that of faith without manners in Islam. Whereby you will find people who may be or may seem to be highly religious and very practicing Muslims and possibly very focused on the rituals of Islam and the pillars, the great pillars of Islam, doing all of these great acts of worship. But when it comes to their character, you find that there is a serious disconnect. Right? This was what we talked about last time. And understandably, in that talk, the whole time I was talking about and expounding the importance of character and khuluq and how it is simply impossible to divorce it from the issue of deen and iman, faith and religiosity, right? Today, we're going to flip that concept on its head, okay? So now we want to talk about the diametrically opposite and equally, if not more dangerous phenomenon and that is to have manners or akhlaq but no faith what do you mean how can someone be called a muslim have manners and akhlaq but no faith no iman if there's no iman then he's not a muslim are we talking about non-muslims well we'll see as you can see the, the two phenomena are exactly opposite, right? And for a very long time, I have been insisting, and I am 100% convinced that extremes, one extreme begets the other extreme. The lack of moderation that our Islam teaches, going to extremes in whatever way, begets the other. I maintain a lot of the differences of opinion that occur within the Muslim Ummah, between the different jama'as and groups and uh, ideologies within Islam, right? A lot of it has to do with going to one extreme in that particular way of thinking, and that will beget, beget the other extreme, the opposite side. If you stick to the, the middle, the path of moderation that the Prophet ﷺ taught us, I believe to a large extent you will at least alleviate, if not eliminate, a lot of those issues and a lot of those differences. In this situation, it seems, which one started? We're not so sure, but let's say that the fact that there are ostensibly practicing Muslims whose character is so uh, repulsive, this possibly then brought about, gave rise to the opposite phenomenon, which is, okay, this is what you think Islam is? I don't need Islam, and but I have very good character. I don't care about what 
you know, you talk about in terms of religiosity and rituals and prayers and all of that. If we apply it to Muslims, then it means that these are not very practicing Muslims, Muslims who are quite far from Islam, maybe they don't even pray, which would be really serious, right? Or maybe they pray every now and then, but you look at their lives and there's very little Islam in it. But they tell you, I have good character. I love everyone. I don't wish ill for anyone. I treat people with respect. And, and, and. And they start to uh, tout all of these different aspects of their good character. They tell you this, you know, the other things, you know, regarding uh, rituals in Islam and so on, I'm not really into that. So you'll see that, right? Amongst people who may call themselves Muslims. They're not really practicing Muslims. Of course, amongst the non-Muslims, it is very clear. Man is without faith. But this is also an issue. So, you will find plenty non-Muslims, possibly of a different religion, possibly without religion whatsoever, but the man has good character, seems to be a good guy, seems to be honest, easy to deal with, right? She is quite amenable, she's friendly, she likes people. And you start to analyze their character and you think they have very good character. You talk to them about Iman, zero. They don't even believe, maybe they don't believe in God. Whatsoever, apart from possibly associating partners with Allah or something else. Maybe they're atheists. There is no God in their life at all. But they say, I have good character. So it's possible that this one phenomenon gave rise, this extreme gave rise to the other. How can you have Islam? How can you have Iman and faith and then lie and steal and be dishonest and so on and so forth. And then we saw the other extreme. And uh, especially, now how is this dangerous? It's dangerous for the Muslims who think they're doing perfectly fine because they have good character, but they could care less about everything else. Right? And it's also very dangerous because it is increasing this type of thinking within the Muslim body as well. Why do you talk so much about, you know, Allah and Salah and this and that? Just be a good person. That's all that's important. Isn't that what you hear? This is what we hear. This is what we've been hearing for a long time and we continue to hear. And you will continue to hear. It's all about how you deal with people, your character, right? The other things, you know, this is private, this is personal to you. You believe, you don't believe. Point is, be good with others, right? What you hear? Do you respond, right? So, uh, this also engendered another dangerous misconception and that is that the Muslims will now say are you telling us that those not this particular non-Muslim is going to enter hellfire I don't have the key to paradise and hellfire but did they die as a Muslim or as a non-Muslim right Oh, but didn't you see what they did? They used to give charity and they used to help people and they did this and they did that and they start mentioning all of their great achievements and possibly great character and how many people like them and love them and would they go to hellfire? This is a dangerous misconception and this started to play with people's concept of Iman and Aqeedah and Paradise and Hellfire and all of this amongst Muslims themselves. You ask a Muslim now, 
a random Muslim on the street, will this person, if they, if they died as a non-Muslim and uh, they uh, knew about Islam but they refused Islam and so on and so forth, will they go to hellfire if they die in that state? Let's say, I don't know. Or no, depends. Uh, you have to see their character. What did they do in their lives? How many followers did they have? I, I don't think it'll go that far. But, uh, but, well, for some people, followers means people like them. So if people like them, why would they be punished in the afterlife? Because that's all it's about now, right? It's about, well, do people like you or not? Not so much, does Allah like you or not? Uh, so you, you, you know, you've been hearing this forever. You know, someone like Mother Teresa or the Mother Teresas of the world, okay, who gave themselves to noble causes and stuff like that. Manners without faith. Right? Character, akhlaq without faith. Well, not completely without faith. There was some faith. We'll talk about that. Another dangerous misconception. This atheist will tell you, you're calling me to your religion, yet I have achieved, to a large extent, everything that religions have come to teach of good character. I don't need your religion. I don't need your religion. I don't need your book. Doesn't your book teach honesty and being good to others and being charitable and helping the needy and this and that? I've already achieved that without religion. So why are you telling me about deen and Islam? Because a lot of Muslims will say that the first thing the religion teaches is luck. To be a good person. He's telling you now, well, I've already achieved that without deen, without faith, without iman. I don't need it. This is partly our fault. If we claim that the first thing the religion teaches is to be a good person. Notice now, everything I'm saying sounds very different than the last lecture, right? That was the opposite, and it's supposed to be that way. I'll explain it, inshallah, at the end. So we say, first of all, that the first thing and the most important thing religion teaches the human being is about their Lord. Who is Allah? Who is your Lord? Who do you worship? What does He require of you? And how you may save yourself in the afterlife. This is what this is the first and most important thing. And this is why the first pillar and that which enters a person into the fold of Islam is to say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. All about faith, iman. It. What do you believe? Who is your Lord? Who do you worship? Okay? This is what. The religion came to teach. Akhlaq and other things will come along the way. But when we say the first thing, the most important thing, it is. Okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, says in the Noble Quran, هو الذي ينزل على عبده آيات بينات ليخرجكم من الظلمات إلى النور وإن الله بكم لرؤوف رحيم. He is the one who sends down upon his slave servant Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم clear signs, clear verses in order to take you out of darknesses. And into light. This is the whole point. This is the ultimate uh, raison d'etre, as they say, of religion. 
to teach people about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we talk about religion, we're talking about the one and only religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is Islam in its broader meaning. Right? Now, because we live in our time, we're talking about the specific Islam which the Prophet ﷺ came with. Before that, it was the Islam that was sent to Isa السلام, Musa السلام, right? Yusuf, Ibrahim, Nuh, all of the Prophets, peace be upon them, all. They were all Muslims and they taught Islam. Albeit, it may have differed in certain ways, okay? in certain minor ways. Otherwise, the crux of the religion and the message is the same. Okay? All of that came, all of the prophets came to teach people and to guide them to their Lord. Okay? So this is the number one. You saw how much I stressed good character last time. I never said that the religion only came down to teach good character. If that was only the case, this atheist's rebuttal would be quite strong. I've achieved it without religion. That is not the case. Okay? First thing is to teach you who Allah is. It's not up to you. It's not something you make up. Like one guy told me, I connect with the divine when I'm out surfing in the ocean. Allah. I'm very happy that you feel a connection, right? But this will not be accepted on the Day of Judgment, okay? It's not that simple, right? There is, that's why the religion is there, to teach people how, who Allah is, what He wants, and how to worship Him, right? If it was only about good character, then there's nothing between us and Allah. Good character, that's here. That's in this domain. That's all. You've completely removed the other domain. This is one point. The other important aspect is to mention the gravity and the dangerousness of the worst sin in Islam, which is shirk. That's it. The worst sin. This is not well understood by Muslims, let alone non-Muslims. What do you mean Muslims do not understand this? It means we, we don't realize how serious a sin this is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Lord of the Quran, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَغْفِرُ أَنْ يُشْرَكَ بِهِ وَيَغْفِرُ مَا دُونَ ذَلِكَ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not forgive if what? If someone associates partners with him. If someone does shirk. And he forgives anything else, anything less than that, or whomever he wishes. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wait. Allah does not forgive shirk? Does Allah forgive shirk? No. The ayah says, what if someone repents from shirk? Then okay. But he said he does not forgive. He does not forgive. He doesn't repent. He does not forgive if he does not repent from it. 
Yes, he will not be forgiven. If he repents, he will forgive. So it means the other forgiveness that is being mentioned is there whether you repent or not. That's how forgiving he is, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah will forgive. If he wills, he will forgive. With repentance or without. If it is less than shirk. That's in the hands of Allah. Allah is the most forgiving. But shirk, he, can only, he will only forgive his repentance. Conditional. That's why in Allah la yaghfiru an yushraka bi. When we say, as in uh, the end of Surah Maryam, وَقَالُوا اتَّخَذَ الرَّحْمَنُ وَلَدَ لَقَدْ جِئْتُمْ شَيْئًا إِدَّا The verse is talking about, again, the gravity of the sin of associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those who said that Allah, Ar-Rahman, has taken son or has a son. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in these verses, just to paraphrase really quickly because we have a lot to cover. He says, you have said something great, so great that the heavens are about to break apart. And Allah, I would have never thought that way. I think a lot of Muslims, if you tell them now, they'd be shocked. So if someone openly in front of them talks about Jesus peace be upon him as the son of God and I tell them by the way as soon as that person said that word the heavens were about to split and the earth was about to split and the mountains were going to fall in ruin the Muslim would be like Sheikh what are you saying what the Quran is saying when you say something like this this is how serious it is do we as Muslims realize that before the non-Muslims? Do we think of it that way? That this is such a serious insult, accusation, disrespect, blasphemy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَكَيْفَ تَكْفُرُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَكُنْتُمْ أَمْوَاتًا فَأَحْيَاكُمْ ثُمَّ يُمِيتُكُمْ ثُمَّ يُحْيِيكُمْ ثُمَّ إِلَيْهِ تُرْجَعُونَ وَكَيْفَ تَكْفُرُونَ How do you disbelieve when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who brought you to life after you were dead and then he decrees death upon you again and then he brings you back to life when he resurrects you. وَكَيْفَ تَكْفُرُونَ How do you disbelieve? So many verses telling us about the gravity of this sin. All of this we need to keep in our minds when we are answering and rebutting and refuting this misconception of that I'm good to everyone. I help everyone. I'm a good person. It's just that I'm not very religious. You hear that as well now. I'm not that type. I'm not really the religious type. So there's not, nothing between me and God, but I'm good to everyone. You have to then come back to these meanings, these concepts. I don't know if I have time to explain this ayah. If I do, uh, maybe I'll tell you at the end. Another beautiful example in order to really uh, drive the message home. But I don't, I don't know if I have time to explain it right now. The famous hadith of Ibn Mas'ud, radiyallahu an, he said, I asked the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ayyudhan bi'a'zam indallah, which is, which sin is the worst in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He said, an taj'ala lillahi niddan, wa huwa alaqaq, that you, you ascribe an equal to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he is the one who created you. That in itself is the worst sin. The fact that he created you and then you ascribe an equal. How do you ascribe an equal? By making others equal to him. And associating partners. 
or possibly the ludicrous phenomenon of our age, which is atheism, which didn't exist in the same way in the past, to deny the existence of God at all. Forget about ascribing an equal. He is denying the existence altogether. This is why the Prophet ﷺ said, the authentic hadith, لا أحد أصبر على أذى يسمعه من الله عز وجل إنه يشرك به ويجعل له الولد ثم هو يعافيهم ويرزقهم الله أكبر. He said, صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم, no one is more patient with something abhorrent that is said about them than Allah. Why? They associate partners with him. And they ascribe a child to him, and then he provides for them, and he gives them health, and so on and so forth. Subhanallah. If Allah were to punish them the way they deserve, for the seriousness of this, they, wouldn't, they would not be on the earth, and neither would anyone else for that matter. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so merciful. On the authority of Ibn Abbas, Allah be pleased with them. The Prophet ﷺ said, I don't know if I have time to mention the, the hadith in Arabic, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Hadith Qudsi, كَذَّبَنِ ibn Adam وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ ذَلِكْ The son of Adam has ascribed lying to me or said a lie about me. And this is not for him to do. In other words, this is not acceptable. And he has insulted me. And this is uh, unacceptable as well. As for saying a lie against me, it is his claim that I am not able to resurrect him as he was before in his original state. And as for his insult, his insult towards me, it is him saying that I have a son. Glorified am I from having a wife or a son. In another uh, narration of Al-Bukhari, the authority of Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu, the Prophet ﷺ said also, Similarly uh, uh, to the, uh, the first narration. But then he says, uh, As for telling a lie against me, it is saying that he will not resurrect me as I was before. And then it continues, وَلَيْسَ أَوَّلُ الْخَلْقِ بِأَهْوَنَ عَلَيَّ مِنْ إِعَادَتِهِ And the first creation is not any easier for me than resurrection. In other words, I created him in the first place. That's no easier than resurrection. Resurrection is not more difficult than that. I created him in the first place from nothing. I'll resurrect him. And as for him insulting me, it is saying that I have a son and I am al-ahad al-samad. Like, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ اللَّهُ samad لَمْ أَلِدْ I did not give birth, nor was I begotten, nor was I given birth to. And there is no one equal to me. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of these concepts help us now to at least ground us so that we can now answer this misconception. But what if someone now going along with this argument says, okay, I'm with you all the way. Shirk is very bad. Allah is the greatest. However, um, the, what about everything that I'm doing with people? Is that all, has that all gone to waste? Is that all useless? Is there no reward? For that, or maybe they will ask, uh, 
I don't have a relationship with my Lord, but I have great relationships with everyone else. And okay, I understand that not believing in Allah is, is a serious sin, but other than that, my relationships are, and I have great character, and everyone praises my character. What do you say then? And for that, I give you the following example. Because now we want to show that uh, neglecting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the expense of everyone else, this is where the danger lies. But sometimes we don't realize it because of so many things. Because of secularism, because of misconceptions, because of a lack of understanding of the gravity of this sin, because of all of that, we have given priority to human relationships and character above that of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is all that people look at now. So now, I give you the example. Okay? Someone who has eight relationships. You look at the way they are with human beings. MashaAllah. This person has such great character, I wish they were Muslim. Or maybe they are not practicing, they, are, they were born Muslim. I wish they were practicing, they have such great character. Again, seemingly that way, because these are the relationships with everyone around them. Everyone loves them, they're so great, they're so this. Then someone comes and tells you, do you know about the relationship with their parents? They are the worst with their parents. I don't know. Wouldn't that change your opinion of them? All of a sudden, no. They're bad with their parents? Who cares if they're good with Joe Schmo and this person and that? Their parents, the most important people in their lives. Their parents who raised them, their parents who spent upon them. This is their relationship. They don't even ask about them. They insult them. They beat them, God forbid. You know, there, there are cases where, where parents have been beaten by their children. Ah, now, subhanAllah, you look at it differently, right? Now, all of a sudden, all of the other relationships have no value because they're ignoring the much more important relationship is exactly the same when we compare to Allah and actually it is much more when it comes to Allah because the rights of Allah upon us are much more than the parents upon their children so now you start to see how ridiculous it is to say this thing that we keep hearing which is yeah, I don't have anything to do with God, but I'm good with everyone else. It's exactly the same. Hello, you are neglecting the most important relationship. How can you abandon Allah? Allah created you, Allah is providing for you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is everything in your life, should be everything in your life. You have not only not made him number one, there is no existence in your life of Allah. And then you're telling me I'm good with people? I'm good with this person and that? Now it sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? When we ground it, when we think about it the way we should, when we start giving and thinking about these examples, how can it be that someone has manners and they are neglecting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Just because they don't believe it, doesn't mean Allah is not their Lord. Allah is their Lord. And just because they don't believe in Him, doesn't mean Allah is not giving them. Allah is giving them and providing for them and keeping their hearts beating. Subhanak ya Allah. So then, the very important question is, will the good works 
of the disbeliever benefit them? What do you guys think? An important question. Hmm? If they repent, then? MashaAllah. Good answer. So if they repent, then their bad deeds will become good. But those were good deeds. They weren't bad deeds. <laughs> right? They were helping the poor, helping the needy. Uh, then they'll be counted. MashaAllah. Okay, it's a very good answer. Anything else? If not, will they be counted? MashaAllah. So how are they counted in this world? What do you mean? No, no, no. He, he, he's telling me. What, what do you mean? How? Oh, MashaAllah. So... It means they will enjoy blessings in this life. Excellent answer. Give him a prize. You have a prize, sister? You need to have, start having prizes. Um, yes, that's absolutely correct. This is one of the opinions of the scholars. That it will benefit them in this world, not in Al-Akhirah. That the, a lot of the blessings they enjoy in the dunya are a consequence of some of those good works that they are doing here. Even if they are disbelievers, they disbelieve in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, when we say here, disbelief, we're talking about everything other than the correct belief. And this is the belief in Islam. Okay, let us be clear about that. So when we say manners without faith, we're talking about specifically the religion of Islam. So even if someone is very highly faithful as a Buddhist, or a Hindu, or a Christian, or some other religion or denomination, we still are saying this is manners without faith because this is not the correct faith. This is not what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept. Tayyip. So, yes, shirk, my brothers and sisters, nullifies all deeds. Okay? Uh, even for the prophets. And Allah. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Noble Quran, وَلَقَدْ أُوحِيَ إِلَيْكَ وَإِلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ لَإِنْ أَشْرَكْتَ يَحْبَطَنَّ عَمَلُكَ وَلَتَكُونَنَّ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ Subhanallah. It has been revealed to you and to those before you that if you commit shirk, your deeds will be nullified and you will be of the losers. Subhanallah. We know the prophets are beyond that. But if the pro this is being said to the prophets, then imagine everyone else. Shirk nullifies all of this. Even if someone ransoms the earth's fill in gold on the Day of Judgment, it is useless. Why? Because of the ease of repentance and transforming one's deeds. As in the authentic hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, where he said that it will be said to the kafir on the day of judgment, what do you say if you had the earth's fill of gold? Would you ransom yourself today from the punishment? And he would say yes. So it would be said to him, you were asked to do much less. You were asked to do much less. Just believe in Allah. Just believe in Allah. That's it. Just say this kalima, ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah. You were asked to do much less. Now you're ready to ransom the earth's fill in gold? To ransom yourself? You were asked to do much less and you didn't. And this proves that ultimately they are lying when they say this. If you were honest and truthful, you would have done what is much easier. Aisha radiallahu anha reports that the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she asked the messenger alayhi salatu wa sallam, O messenger of Allah, Ibn Jud'an, relative of hers, Ibn Jud'an, in the time of Jahiliyyah, 
He used to connect with his kin, with his relatives. He used to feed the needy, the miskeen. Will this benefit him? Very important question. Aisha radiallahu anha herself is asking it. So the Prophet said, La yanfa'u. La yanfa'u. Innahu lam yaqul yawman Rabbi ghfir li khati'ati yawmaddeen. He said it will not benefit him. Why? He never said once, Oh Allah, forgive my sins on the Day of Judgment. The ayah, just that one expression, just turning towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instead of turning away. Just to say that, just to recognize that you have a Lord. In the other famous hadith, which I do not have time to, to, to mention now, beautiful hadith, not very oft quoted. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, My slave servant sought for my forgiveness and knew that he had a Lord who would forgive him, so I have forgiven him. And the person goes back to sinning again. And then again he says, Oh Allah, forgive me. And Allah says, My safe servant knew that he has a Lord who forgives sins, and he saw my forgiveness, so I forgive him. Just knowing and acknowledging, I have a Lord who forgives sins, and I seek forgiveness from him. He never said, he used to be a good man. He used to be a good man. He could be among us today, doing all of these good things, manners without faith. Will this benefit him? He never once said, forgive my sins of the day of judgment. This person they're asking you about, this Mother Teresa they're asking you about, or I don't know, they might even say it about Nelson Mandela, but he is more political activism and stuff, but some may say that as well. Then you might use this argument. Did he once or she once say, Oh Allah, not Jesus or anyone else, forgive my sins on the day of judgment. So, if someone were to ask, okay, then, and here's, you know, everyone wants to make it more difficult and ask the difficult questions. So, if that's the case, which is better? Faith without manners or manners without faith? Well, I say in the first place, why are you asking it as if they are two mutually exclusive things? It's almost like either this with, with, without this or this without this. They cannot come together. Subhanallah, why? <laughs> why can't you have them together? That's the whole point of the deen, to have them together. They build upon one another, they complement one another. What? Maybe uh, they say, well, it's not exactly uh, happening, so which one is better? And then we might say that in this worldly life, Manners without faith is better. Especially for my dealings with this person. If I'm going to deal with this person, maybe financially or something else, I need to make sure that they are, they have good character in that way. Believe me, their qiyam will not help my business in any way or that transaction. Their siyam does not help me in any way. Right? This is what a lot of Muslims will say when in their dealings. If it's going to be between a Muslim who has bad character that I cannot deal with and a, a non-Muslim, 
who has good character that I can trust and so on and so forth. Oh, I uh, rather go with the other person. So in this worldly life, we might say manners without faith. But definitely in Al-Akhirah, it's faith without manners. If, there's, if you're going to make that mutually exclusive decision, either manners without faith or faith without manners, definitely in Al-Akhirah, manners without faith will not help you. It's going to be faith without manners. That means it is that person, yes, they had bad character, they will be punished for that. But eventually, if they had correct iman, ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah, eventually, inshallah, they will enter paradise. In the akhirah, definitely, it would be Islam or iman uh, without akhlaq. But again, I'm not mutually exclusive, brothers and sisters. Do not make them that way. In fact, they complement each other and promote each other. Like you say, it's quite obvious that Iman promotes Akhlaq. How does Akhlaq promote Iman? That's a tough one. Any ideas? Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe they'll see that religion commands this, and I'm doing it anyway. Okay. Okay, okay. All right. What else? Any other ideas? Again, brother, uh, can you just remove your mask for a second? Thank you. Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. So in Islam, we do those things seeking the pleasure of Allah, but they are not. You see, they're doing it because it makes them feel good, because they think it's a good thing. Uh, I don't know what, you know, there may be so many other incentives for them. The answer to this, Wallahu A'lam, is in the hadith of Hakim ibn Huzam, Hizam, radiallahu an. Uh, when he said to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, O Messenger of Allah, things I used to do. Things I used to do, and he, interestingly, he used a, a word or an expression that essentially means worship. Something that I would do, that I used to do before, in the jahiliya. Things that I used to do in the jahiliya. Will I get anything for that? And what is understood from this is immediate. It's similar to... The hadith of Ibn Jud'an. Things that we used to do in the Jahiliya, good act, noble deeds, right? Will I have anything from that? You know what the Prophet ﷺ said? He said, Aslamta ala ma aslafta min khair. Aslamta ala ma aslafta min khair. Any Arabic speakers here other than. Brother Wadah here. Have you heard this hadith, Abu uh, Amin? No. Oh, brother, bro also? Oh, okay, raise your hand. Yeah, don't be shy. The Arabic speakers. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Well, I mean, you taught him, mashallah, uh, that excellent answer, or his mother. Um, what could this possibly mean? أسلمت على ما أسلفت من خير. 
So an Arabic speaker hearing this will immediately say, oh, this is not immediately obvious. What, what does that mean? And that's why scholars differed. What could it possibly mean? Aslamta ala ma aslafta min khayr. What do you mean? Okay. Ah, okay. So, by doing these things, essentially you have become Muslim like that? Okay, all right. Yeah, brother? No? Uh, in another narration, he asked, أَتَحَنَّثُ بِهَا فِي الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ مِنْ صَدَقَةٍ أَوْ عَتَاقَةٍ أَوْ صِلَةِ رَحِمْ أَفِيهَا أَجْرٍ So in the other narration, he, he explicitly mentioned, okay, uh, sadaqa, freeing slaves, uh, connecting with kin and relatives, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, there are different interpretations. Al-Qadi Iyad, subhanAllah, says the following. It is said, that the meaning is that with the barakah of that good you used to do, Allah guided you to Islam. I'm surprised no one thought of that. So it's almost like these good deeds that you are doing please Allah. And this was a reason for you to be guided to Islam. And Islam will only strengthen those aspects, right? It, it wouldn't eliminate it. If it does, then the person has a serious misunderstanding. So it is those things that essentially led you to Islam. Allah guided you because of those good things that you used to do. This is why, my brothers and sisters, when we see people with good character, we hope Insha'Allah, that they may be close to Islam. When you see a non-Muslim who has good character, work on them. There is a good chance. Yes, this misconception might be stopping them, which is, I'm a good person, why do I need religion? That's when you would need to now show them that, no, it's not only about that. But if they are, if they have that type of character, Insha'Allah, they might already be close. It might already be easy, and it would be there would be a reason that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala uh, would guide them. And Al Qadi Ayad continues, and he says that whatever good came out in the beginning will definitely manifest itself later on in the end, and therefore uh, they became uh, Muslim. Al Maziri famous Shafi'i scholar said that there are interpretations and he said uh, one of the interpretations is that uh, you have achieved a certain level of good character and therefore you will benefit from that good character when you become Muslim. So it's almost like you have gotten accustomed to this and then all that's left is that you uh, announce that you are a believer. Usually it is the opposite. We become Muslims and our religion teaches us about uh, good character. Of course, it doesn't mean you can't learn, you know, everything you learn about good character is from the religion, but for all practical purposes, this is the crux of the deen, right? Um, the other possible interpretation is that you have achieved something and you have received praise for that good character before as a non-Muslim and this will continue when you become a Muslim. And then he mentioned uh, another interpretation as well. And he mentions that if the kafir does any good deed, then it may lessen their punishment on the Day of Judgment. They die as a disbeliever. Some scholars were of the opinion that their good works in the dunya will lessen their punishment in Al-Akhirah. This is another opinion. Allahu Akbar. Uh,
The reason for interpreting the hadith in the first place is that uh, scholars are pretty much in agreement that a disbeliever cannot perform such good deeds and be rewarded for it for several reasons. Number one, they are not seeking reward from it. Number two, if they are seeking reward from it, they're not seeking it from Allah. Kind of like, you know, you're at work, brother, or you're, no, wait, you're, you're working privately. You don't have a boss. Do you have a boss? You're your own boss. It's nice. Anyone here working for a boss? No? Subhanallah. Brother? No one has a boss. Brother, you have a boss? Not really? <laughs> Alhamdulillah, everyone is an entrepreneur, huh? Allah. Well, if you have a boss, imagine now going to another employee and saying, where's my salary? What salary? Why are you asking me? Go to your boss. So, you are seeking reward from whom? From Jesus? Or from this thing you call a God? You, you seek reward, you go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is the one who gives reward. So, it will not be accepted from them. So, uh, this is why some scholars now try to interpret the hadith. Okay? Because how can they be rewarded for something good that they have done? Of course, did I translate? Aslamta ala ma aslafta min khayr, meaning that aslamta, you have become Muslim, essentially. Uh, and this is the difficult part. Allah, upon, or it could be interpreted as after, okay, on, okay, right, exactly, due to uh, what good you did before. So they try to find interpretations. Al Imam al Nawawi uh, says that many scholars actually said it does not need interpretation. And the correct understanding of it is that what the brother said, subhanAllah, if they, if a person becomes a Muslim and repents, then everything they did, those good deeds, they did those good works, will become hasanat. They will be rewarded for it. Allahu Akbar. So it's almost like, what's that? Yeah, they will be converted. They will be accepted. If they do not, then it's waste. Aba and Manthura. But if they accept Islam, all of those good works they did, these are hasanat. Allahu Akbar. And this is the understanding of the, uh, the interpretation of this hadith. What's that? Backdated, yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what it is, subhanAllah. So, you know, when you see that type of person, all oh, good, good in character, doing good things, you know, it's, it's sad to think that they're just, you know, this far away, just become Muslim and all of this will become mountains of good deeds for you. Otherwise, it's not. And would you have the, the courage and the audacity to, to say it to them? You know, like that, as, as, as clear as it is. It's very interesting. Um, it's very interesting that this understanding seems to be communicated by a great lady. A great lady of Islam. Her name is Khadija radiallahu anha. How? This understand me, I'm trying to say, as bad and dangerous as a misconception it is, that manners are enough without faith, you can kind of understand where they're coming from. That's a tough one.
after Iqra, the incident of Iqra, what happened? And she was consoling him, right? What did she say to him? Subhanallah. Have you ever thought of it that way? You, you know, Allah will never forsake you. Don't worry. Why? You help the needy and the poor and you do this and you do that. We've heard this a hundred times, have we not, brothers and sisters? Is there a person here who has not heard this incident or this narration? And she's saying, you do this and you help and you have good character. Allah will not forsake you. As long as you are like that, Allah will not forsake you. And Allah. Means they go hand in hand. This is what Allah wants. This is what the religion teaches. If you are already like that, you have already achieved so much. But you need to believe. You need to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, at his time, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was a muwahid, as we know, right? He was a muwahid. Yes, he did not receive the message yet. But he used to worship Allah in his own way. And he would go, right, to the uh, Ghar of Hira, and he would reflect, subhanAllah. And he did not indulge in what his people did. And he had the best of character. Thus Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him uh, and made him the final messenger. It's interesting that um, the Prophet actually informed us that something similar would happen. Because he says, as in the uh, hadith of Hudayfa ibn al Yaman, uh, it's a long hadith, and in, in a part of it, the Prophet is saying that there will be a time where a person will be seen and they will talk about him and say in Arabic ما أعقله وما أظرفه وما أجلده وما في قلبه مثقال حبة خردل من إيمان عنك يا رب So he's saying that it will be said to you know a certain man ما أعقل how smart and how intellectual he is وَمَا أَضْرَفَ And how uh, nice, gentle, pleasant he is. وَمَا أَجْلَدَ And how uh, convincing and uh, strong he is. So, all this praise for this particular person. And the Prophet ﷺ says, And in his heart there is not the weight of a mustard seed of iman. Isn't that describing the phenomenon precisely? Isn't this what, what, what is happening? Praising these people for all kinds of things. Maybe they are doing great works. Maybe they're doing more works than the opposite, the ones we mentioned last time. The big beard and the niqab and hijab and zero character. Maybe these people are doing a lot more when it comes to good character and helping and doing good works and deeds. But in their heart, not a mustard seed of iman. So the Prophet is telling us this is no good. This is not acceptable. This is a sign of the times. This is what people will be saying. Oh, look at this and look at that. They are concentrating on the wrong thing. They're looking at the wrong things. They're praising the wrong things. There's no iman. And then they tell you, no, oh, that's in between them. That's in their heart. That's personal. I have nothing to do with that. Okay, fine. Yes, you have nothing to do with that here. I agree. If I'm dealing with a person, again, I want to deal with someone with good character. I agree. But if you truly cared for this person, and you believed that there is an afterlife, then you need to care about what is in their heart as well. And it's very interesting when um, just recently... 
when, uh, and I think it became a sensation and started going everywhere, when uh, Muslim brother tweeted to Elon Musk, and he was telling him, oh, you do so many great things and inventions and this and that, yeah. but remember your creator, you know, something along those lines, right? Right, well, what did uh, Elon Musk reply? Other than he said, you know, I, I, I don't know, I don't really care, whatever it is. Very interesting what he said. He said, I have essentially come to terms with the fact that I and most people are going to enter hellfire anyway. Allah, Allah Akbar. This is very interesting for several reasons. Number one, um, why are you so quick to... Uh, consign yourself to hellfire. This is, you might be of the people of paradise. You haven't died yet. You're doing so many great things. Why don't you also consider believing in Allah? Allahu Akbar. Yes, you're right. Some people are that arrogant. Allahu Akbar. Yes. Yeah, yeah, maybe he will buy, or, or maybe, maybe he can bribe the judge on the day of judgment, right? <laughs> like they do over here. <laughs> bribe the judge, subhanAllah. Um, the point is, so number one, why to, to immediately consign yourself? Just like the, the Quran says, you know, uh, bring the punishment when they would tell the, the, the prophets and the messengers, bring the, prophet if you are, uh, the, the punishment if you are indeed truthful, subhanAllah. Why are you rushing the punishment? But the other very interesting thing, the brother did not talk about paradise or hellfire. He said, your creator, believe. Musk took it to paradise and hellfire. Subhanallah. So there's this connection immediately. Ah, belief in Allah? After life. Subhanallah. Immediate connection. If there is a believer in Allah, that means there is judgment day. That means there is paradise and hellfire. There is accountability. On his own. And he said, subhanAllah, I and most people born are going to hellfire. That's another interesting thing. Do you know that most people are going to hellfire? He might be right. Where did he get that from? Islamically, we know that because the Prophet ﷺ told us that 999 of the 1,000 are going to be from Ya'juj and Ma'juj, alhamdulillah, right, of the, of the inhabitants of the hellfire. But the point is that uh, that connection, right, you talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you're talking about uh, something called paradise and hellfire. So when... When I am talking about this, it's not because I'm saying they don't have good character. No, they might have excellent character. But if I really care about them, then I have to look at another aspect. And this is their iman. Not because I can see what's in their heart, but because that's what's going to save them or not on the Day of Judgment. Yes, brother. No, no, uh, who knows? Even if he consigns himself to hellfire, maybe he will be guided. Allah Akbar. Yeah, maybe. May Allah guide him. May Allah guide him. Finally, brothers and sisters, and to conclude, if you have uh, attended both lectures, and you heard me speak last time about faith without manners, and you heard me speak about today manners without faith, you might say that they're two different people speaking. You are saying the exact opposite. There you were speaking about the importance of, of manners the whole time and how uh, faith is, you know, it's, it's going to affect faith if you don't have good character. And here you're talking about you have to have faith and good character will not help you in the least. Because... 
the whole point is to speak about each of them individually, independently, and show their importance and emphasize it individually and uh, uh, independently. Each of them is that important. And then they become so important together and they complement one another. You have to have both. You need both. If you truly want to be saved on the Day of Judgment entirely, they are both critically important. And they are critically important for the Da'wah as well. Because we said, we talked last time about how men with beards and women with hijab and niqab are destroying the Da'wah. Right? And similarly now, you may say the opposite. Uh, So-called practicing Muslims or non-Muslims with good character are also somehow negatively affecting the da'wah because people are now starting to have this misconception. It's becoming, it's becoming quite rampant for people to say, well, just be a good person. You know, uh, some people who do not want to appear to be too Islamic, let's say on YouTube, if they're talking about Ramadan, they won't really say, oh, worshipping Allah and Quran and dhikr and prayers. And they'll say, this is the time to really uh, be a good person and really uh, uh, improve yourself and your character. And that's true. That's true. It's not only about that, right? But this is what a lot of people now are starting to say. Finally, one may ask, if as you said, that ultimately, faith without manners, again, if they are mutually exclusive, if that is more important than Manners without faith, stay with me, if that is the case, case sorry, <laughs> then uh, why did you mention faith without manners first? In other words, uh, sorry, yeah, if faith without manners is more important, then why are you, even if you don't have manners, but you have faith, right? This is more important and ultimately, inshallah, you will be of the people of paradise, even though if you had bad character and so on. But this is eventually, right? This is eventually. We remember the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. If she has bad character and even if she's praying qiyam, he said she's in the fire. Of course, we understand that to mean not eternally, right? But that she's going to be punished for that. But eventually, they will be of the people of Paradise, right? So if that is the case, in other words, which one is more dangerous? To have faith without manners or manners without faith? Having manners without faith is, is more dangerous because then you don't have iman whatsoever. So if that's the case, why didn't you mention it first? Why didn't I mention that in the first talk and then this one in this one? And I would say that... Uh, Briefly, that this is a, uh, a Quranic uh, guidance, a Quranic precept. I don't have a lot of time to, to, to explain the ayah, but it's, it's, it's beautiful and maybe I'll do it in another occasion and in a different context. But the, the, the summary of it is that when a certain accusation is leveled against you, first acknowledge the phenomena. Acknowledge that that is indeed an issue. And that is indeed a problem. And after you acknowledge, then you can deal with the rest of the situation. But first acknowledge it. And that's what I was doing. Acknowledging that yes, so when these people do come to us and say, 
you talk about the beautiful religion of Islam and character and this and that, but we see people who are seemingly practicing and they don't exhibit this and they don't exhibit that. So yes, we acknowledge that there is a problem there. We want to deal with it. However, this is not to say that therefore you are correct and all that matters is akhlaq and manners regardless of faith. And that's why I ordered it the way I did. Allah Ta'ala A'lam Jazakumullahu Khayran Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa Any uh, questions or comments? Yes, brother. Let me see. Hablu min Allah, hablu min al-Nas. What about it? You wouldn't be able to see it from... So... I've heard this term and phrase used quite a bit and I've, I only heard it when I came to Malaysia, interestingly. And um, I can see kind of why it's being used, but sometimes it's kind of being used in the wrong context. The context of the verse is, when it's talking about the Jews, is that sometimes... Uh, they will be helped through habil min Allah, okay, or habil min al nas. Habil is a rope. So it's a rope, it's a connection to Allah, or in other words, through Allah or through people, right? And then it's kind of extrapolated, and I, I, I can see now that it's, it's kind of a concept here. It's kind of extrapolated to be understood in the way we just said, which is that there is that vertical relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then almost a horizontal one with a nas, with, with people. And it's kind of an extrapolation, but uh, overall, yes, it's mentioning Allah and it's mentioning a nas. That's kind of the, where they're taking it. But it's sometime kind of, it's, sometimes it's kind of taken out of context. But ultimately, we know that that is the case. And we see يعني, throughout the religion that yes, there uh, are things that concern the servant's relationship to their Lord and uh, otherwise that concerns their relationship to those around them. Anything else? Yes, brother. Getting to the first point, that Hmm. Hmm. Uh, you want to mention it? Is it there? Oh, go ahead, you can read it to us. Oh, okay, okay. I thought you had it in English. Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, he's talking about uh, how. Uh, this ayah, in the deen and Allah al-Islam, that the religion uh, in the sight of Allah is Islam. As we mentioned in part of the talk when we were talking about that this is the only religion that is acceptable to Allah. And when we talk about faith, we're talking about correct faith. So it is uh, Allah telling uh, uh, the people that there is no religion other than Islam that uh, he will accept from anyone. Uh, and this is to follow the messengers in that which uh, Allah sent them uh, with in every time 
until they, it was finally concluded with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Who essentially closed off the paths to Allah except through Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, whoever then, uh, whoever lives after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has to believe in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in order to uh, meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the Day of Judgment as a believer. Otherwise, and this is the, essentially the, the meaning of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ when he said that uh, any, uh, if any Jew or Christian has heard of me and then did not believe, then they, they will be of the people of the hellfire. This is the, the meaning of the hadith. So the only way, the only acceptable religion to Allah is Islam. And that requires uh, a belief in Muhammad ﷺ as the final messenger. Absolutely. Jazakallah khair, brother. Of course, um, uh, what you can emphasize is that when you expand your horizon to include Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that is a more inclusive domain because that includes all of the other prophets you believe in before such as Jesus peace be upon him and Moses and all of the prophets peace be upon them all so and sometimes this is a worthy clarification in order to let them know that you are not forsaking everyone else because you are believing in Muhammad it's the exact opposite it includes everyone else, but in the correct way. It just corrects what is wrong about your idea about Jesus. So, and this is what you know, I usually tell a Christian. When you now accept Muhammad wasallam, you're not forsaking Jesus. It's the other way around. You're actually accepting. And we are forced to believe and love Jesus, peace be upon him. But again, in the correct way. It is just correcting, that's it. You're not forsaking anything. You're not for, it, it, it actually will grow. Your, your love of Jesus, peace be upon him, will flourish. And of, the, and of the other prophets, but in the correct way. You don't forsake anything. Sometimes they may think, oh, it's almost like it's exclusive. Oh, no, you, now you have to accept Muhammad. You know, that's it. You know, Jesus, peace be upon him, died, or, you know, his time is gone. Now you have to accept Muhammad. You know, some Muslims might present it that way. Now you have to accept Muhammad. So he'll think, oh, so I have to forsake, you know, and just, I don't really know Muhammad. I'll stick to Jesus or Moses or something. You, this is not the way to say it. This is not the way to present it. You know, no, it's the other way around. And then you start talking about, who Jesus, peace be upon him, is in Islam. Musa alayhi salam. Musa is mentioned more than all of the other prophets in the Quran. Right? Anything else? Jazakumullah khayran. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.